Uh, good morning. This is a quick hit from Real Wealth Solutions podcast uh, with myself, Darren Light, and my co-host, Greg Scully. Um, we like to have different guests, but occasionally we do what we call a quick hit where we just talk about anything and uh, everything that could be going on with multifamily and trying to add value uh, to you, uh, the listeners and the viewers. Uh, and this morning, we're just going to touch on the uh, four different types of financing that you can take advantage of, uh, not just in multifamily, but your other real estate portfolios as well. Um, those are hard money, uh, private money, sort of the same bucket. We'll go into the differences of those, as well as uh, banks and credit unions. And then finally, the last one is uh, agency debt. Um, Greg, any initial thoughts before we get started on the first one? No, not really. I mean, these are just very common questions that we hear or see online. They come up at the meetup. Uh, a lot of times it's a kind of a, how do you get started? Maybe you don't have an expansive credit history. So there, there are different avenues out there available. And some of this is specific to what you're trying to accomplish. If, if it's a flip, you're certainly not going to be going to agency debt. That's a multifamily product, but uh, you know, we do a little bit of flipping. Uh, we've utilized most of these. So this will largely just be speaking from our experience and give you some, some parameters to think about uh, what some of these different terms mean and, and, and what you might be getting by using them. Good summary. Uh, let's start with the first one, hard money. Uh, hard money or private money, as it's sometimes referred to. And uh, like we were discussing early on, hard money generally refers to a company or maybe some type of fund that, you know, uh, lends all over the country. Um, and their rates vary for their rates are generally more expensive, anywhere from like eight to 12 to 15% interest um, with a lot of, um, uh, Usually that I'm not, that I'm aware of, not very many, I've never seen a prepayment penalty on those, but you know, an extension can be very costly. Like it could be three points. Uh, they make their money obviously on fees, but they're extremely high. Um, anything you want to add to that part? Yeah, and just uh, let's explain what points are. So points are just uh, an additional fee, usually at the front end of the deal. So if you're getting a $100,000 hard money loan from somebody and they're charging three points, uh, you're being charged $3,000. So it's generally 1% of the loan amount, right, Darren? Am I right on correct. that? Correct, okay. that's correct. Yeah. Uh, a, a point is a percentage point and um, a lot of times on hard money loans, you are required to make monthly payments. Um, mm -hmm. So that's another sort of disadvantage. Um, this sort of leads us into private money, if you will, but private money is more of uh, an individual. If I was giving you a loan or vice versa, um, they're a little bit more negotiable. Just, you know, someone that you know from your meetup that has some you know, cash laying around in a self-directed account or just cash in general in a liquid account, a regular savings account or something like that, that they want to make a little bit of money on. So, you know, people, <clears throat> people in this day and age realize that the banks don't make you any interest in like they used to. And so they can make eight to 10 to 12% on their money. Generally it comes with no prepayment penalty. And generally um, there's no monthly payments uh, there's no point up front, no points up front. If there are points up front, it's a lot less than a hard money lender, maybe half to one point total. Uh, and then as in our case, which we <clears throat> are going through a private money loan currently, and I have done two or three in the past, um, you're not making monthly payments. You will pay. We're using this for a flip currently about to, and we will pay the, um, money holder when the property sells. And that's usually guaranteed with a promissory note against uh, the property, that's just common. And uh, so if you had to extend, sometimes in this case, particular lender, instead of a half a point or point for an extension, it's an actual fee. And this person has realized that, hey, I'm not gonna make money off the fees. I'm just gonna charge them what I get charged for telling my self-directed 
uh, IRA company uh, need to use to keep this money out further. So I thought that was interesting as well. I just learned this. Um, and if they are charging number. points, like you said, they're usually lower and, and often, and it's the same with hard money lenders that <laughs> Um, you might get charged more points on your first deal than, than you will be on your fifth deal with them. So, um, absolutely. As well as your interest rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So relationship with, building, you know, is good in both categories. Um, the, the, you know, the hard money is more expensive that gets people hung up. But if you just price, like if you price that monthly payment that might come along with it as a holding cost into your, uh, pro forma for the project and everything still pencils out, then the cost of the money is somewhat irrelevant to uh, the project if, if you're still able to meet your, your business plan. Yeah. So uh -huh. yes, it is expensive, but, and they, like Darren said, these tend to be more uh, businesses. It may be an institution. It might be a small family office or something like that. So uh, you know, they advertise, they have overhead, they likely have employees and stuff like that. So th they do have to charge more because they are carrying some expenses themselves because they too are a business. Whereas the private money is, might be somebody just have some cash on hand that they, that they want to just put to work and recycle every six months at, at 8%, you know, and then your actual annualized return, if you're able to turn that twice a year is significantly higher right one of the other things about hard money lenders is um they they will do it based on a credit score which if obviously the higher your credit score the better terms you'll get but if it is your first loan with them especially if it's your very first flip and you have nothing to prove that hey yes i've done 10 flips you're they're taking a chance on you so even though you have a great a higher a good credit score uh, they may, they're not going to give you the, the, their best terms right out of the gate. They want to make you prove yourself. And then as you continue to do more loans, you touched on this, um, they'll, it, they'll make less money on you for the same type of project moving forward because you've proven to them that you can do it. However, they also have loans where they don't check your credit score and those interest rates and points up front are even higher than what they would be if they're able to use because you can make a request to have this type of loan. And generally your LTV loan to value that they lend on that is only about maybe 65% of the total purchase and rehab costs. So, you know, you might be in a situation there where you're only able to pay for the purchase and then you have to go get the rehab money somewhere else. Whereas with a private money lender, you're basically just putting up the asset that you're trying to flip as collateral for the loan. Um, they, there's a deed of trust that goes against that. Um, but you, you're the guarantor as well, but in the hard money situation, you are the guarantor. They're coming right after you. Uh, and then I guess there's some where they'd also have a deed of trust as well. They might do one or the other, or they may do both. Right. And I think on the hard money side, they, they typically go after the, they're connected to the deed more directly. They, t they tend to be protecting themselves a, a little bit more in the legal sense than than me loaning money to Darren. Uh, there's just tends to be more structure. <laughs> and the advantage of both of these is that they can act very quickly. So if you get a deal across your desk from a wholesaler or something, uh, hard money, private money, you know, it can be a week to maybe three weeks, I think is pretty typical for them to be able to qualify and actually uh, disperse on a project. So, um, and uh, in my experience, it, it's, it's fairly low bar of information that they're looking for. I mean, if it happens to happen in a week, a lot of times there's no appraisal. Um, they're, they're, they're looking at, uh, you know, your, your purchase price versus the, uh, the ARV. And mm -hmm. uh, if they see enough meat on the bone that, they have a couple of outs by if the lender or the the lendee doesn't perform, then they get the asset that that has a lot of meat on the bone that they could probably just hand over to a wholesaler and correct get their money back <laughs> out of it. Yeah, each of those types of lenders, hard money and private money, private money lender, um, especially with the private money lender, you want to be dealing with someone that that knows what they're doing. It's a little seasoned, and my point of that is. 
they both will look at the asset and know that, oh, well, if they default, this is a good deal for us. We can still sell it at retail or, or current state and still make money on it and get our money back. So they're not just going to lend on anything that you think is a good deal. They, they, they know how this works. They know how flipping works. For example, um, they want to make sure that it's a good deal for you first. And then they know it is for them as a backup moving forward. So they're not just throwing their, their money uh, to the wind. Yeah. And these are both good, you know, if you have a private money lender and a hard money lender in your network, uh, kudos to you. A lot of times private money will have a limited amount of, of resources available to them. You might go to your private money lender and they'll be like, hey, I'm tapped. I've got, I've got everything deployed right now. So in order to keep that deal going, yeah, you might have to go pay a little bit more. Um, but those hard money lenders generally are, are able to act at, at any time on on deals that hit their criteria. So you might pay a little bit more, but you'll still be able to get the deal done. And, uh, you know, let's just talk about how to find these guys. So private money stuff, um, you know, that's, that could be friends and family, honestly, that can, uh, I would certainly recommend going to local meetups um, and, ju and just talking to people because uh, they're out there. Uh, this, this, this is a business model that is used uh, more often than you might think. So, so they're out there networking as well. You just got to go find them. Um, and then on the hard money side, uh, there's, there's uh, loan brokers. So you may be able to find a commercial loan broker again through, uh, through probably larger meetups and, and larger MSAs. They, they will probably go to those, might not find them here in our small Tri-Cities area, uh, but then also on things like LinkedIn or, or, or more um, active, larger Facebook groups. I don't, it's bigger pockets. Do they, they probably have some as paid advertisers and stuff. Uh, yeah, I think they do. I know they can and, be a little weird about <laughs> what happens in the actual forums, but. Uh, There's another national uh, sort of website. I think it's called connectedinvestors.com yep. or something like yep. that, where you can put it in your city and, you know, people will pop up. But uh, I highly recommend uh, what you said about LinkedIn. You can definitely find some people there. And a lot of times you, a lot of times people will reach out to you if they see what you're into on LinkedIn and you're active on there. Yeah. Yeah. And you may not even find these specific people at meetups. You will, but also just ask around who's, people that you know at the meetups that are doing flips or in real estate and their specific niche uh, market is they've already done business with a lot of these people and they'll just refer you to them. And that's how we found this particular one that we're using now. Um, and you know, a lot of times some of your partners that you do bigger stuff with like multifamily, they may be into it, but you don't know unless you ask. So to Greg's point, I think there's a lot more people out there doing this than, than people realize. And, and one more advantage I want to uh, just make a point about in regards to hard money or private money is when you have a wholesaler that's, you know, all wholesalers are like cash only, cash only. And sometimes you'll see an MLS listing that's like cash only. This is a vehicle that you can use as your cash. And since they're able to close quickly, um, you know, one to three weeks, three weeks is usually the max. You can, you're basically bringing cash to the table. It's not your own cash, but, but that's what it is as opposed to a traditional loan through a community bank. Um, so mm -hmm. just keep that in mind. If that's your cash revenue or um, resource, if you will. Yeah, because I mean, put it into context, even if you're doing stuff for yourself out of your own like checkbook IRA, you know, it, you, and you need to pay cash within a week, your intention may be to use your own cash, but in order to make the specific transaction happen, you're personal resources will take too long. So you could use these kind of resources as a very short bridge just to get, uh, like you could take a hard money loan, buy the property, and then if you wanted to use your own resources, just pay that hard money loan back when you're able mm -hmm. to get that access yeah. to your own cash. So it can, be, it can be extremely short term. And that's why you, know, you might see Absolutely. some of the points uh, on some of these deals because they, they know they're in this, very mm -hmm. short term game anyway, the, the actual real dollars from their percentage can be very low if, if somebody pays them back within weeks or a month. So they want to make some money and that's where the points come in. Right. 
Uh, let's just talk about terms real quick. Uh, so this is this tends to be very short term stuff. Uh, six months to a year, typically. Um, and then there, there's typically is something written in. And if there's not, you should request it for for an extension of uh, three to six or, or whatever whatever uh, you're comfortable with, that will usually cost you a point or whatever. There's usually a fee associated with, with extending. Correct. So just keep that in mind. And when you're using the hard money guys that their companies, most of this will be dictated to you rather than become any kind of a negotiation. There might be a little bit of wiggle room, but I would expect that, you know, be prepared that what is presented from you from a true hard money lender is more or less what you're going to have to work with you over time. Yeah. You might get a break on points and the interest rate, but the, the contractual side yeah. of it would, would probably stay fairly consistent. Yeah. Example of private money. You're correct on hard money. Basically the numbers are what they are until you prove yourself on um, private money. Uh, we were just most recently looking for an 8% loan person we are going to do the deal, the loan with generally does 10 and we settled at nine. No big deal. So that's so we're good to move on to community bank slash credit union type stuff. Right. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. So yeah, community bank, credit union stuff. This this can also be used for flips. So we'll we'll kind of maybe talk about it in a couple of different contexts. But uh, generally speaking, your your community banks um, can be fairly flexible with you. Um, the disadvantage of them is that it is recourse debt. So uh, not only will they be looking at the property as uh, collateral, that you're also typically signing a personal guarantee. Um, you may see terms that are a little less favorable than, than you may want. Five and seven year terms are, are very common. You know, we look to try and get as long a term as possible. Seven or 10 years is what we try and shoot for. Um, and some of what I'm talking about there here is relative to the next type of debt that we're gonna talk about, which is agency debt. So when I say that their interest rate is high, I'm, I'm saying that it's high relative to the top tier debt that is available. Um, so just keep yeah, that in comparable, mind. But yeah, as a comparable. It's still cheap overall. I mean, yeah, like we were quoted, right. you know, four percent or something on this deal that we were looking at. I'm four percent's a great rate, but the very top tier debt might be actually like three and a quarter or something for for the same property if we were able to get it qualified with agency. Right. So. Um, and you might, yeah, like I just said, you might see a, a slightly higher interest rate than 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 what you might see quoted from from agency debt um but and shorter amortization and um, shorter amortization uh, yeah so you know 25. if you just walk into your local bank and have never done a deal with them one of your first quotes is probably going to be you know in today's terms hey you know four and a half to four point seven five percent with a 20 year am in a five year term okay those are correct those are very favorable to the bank. Uh, and most likely a point or point, a, like a point or point and a half origination fee. Yeah, yeah, maybe so. Um, but they have gotten generally more competitive with top tier agency debt. Um, and they can pl also play a very useful role as a, uh, a really nice bridge loan to agency debt. So, you know, we're going to talk more about multifamily now is if you've got a project that is uh, not quite seasoned to the level that you want to go to the very long term, super great terms of agency debt, you can use community banks or credit unions as a really competitive bridge to get you there. So, if you got a rehab plan or, or whatever, that's going to take you two or three years to execute, you know, having to pay a, a, a percentage point more and still be out before that five-year term balloon has come through. 
and maybe negotiate down a prepayment penalty to, to something that you can stomach and is written into the exit into agency debt. Um, it's a heck of a lot cheaper than traditional bridge loans. Let's put it that way. Correct. Yeah, it's a great vehicle to get your property stabilized uh, to that. Generally, an agency requirement is 90% occupied for 90 days. This is what we talk about a lot in multifamily. And in order to get that, you know, much cheaper than, like you just said, a bridge loan. Um, and if you can get it, that's what you should do. So that way, when you do refinance the agency debt, you already have a proven track record. It's much easier to get the agency loan than it would be if you had originated with the agency loan, which we can talk about a little bit more as we get to agency. I want to make one point in regards to flips for community banks versus uh, credit union. Uh, this is based on personal experience, and I think it's across the board with a lot of credit unions, but you know, most credit unions are very localized, very centralized to a city or area. And uh, because of that, they're not bound by, I guess they're not bound by FDIC regulations or whatever regulations that regulate traditional community banks on the community bank side. If you're gonna go get a loan to flip a home, you're still gonna put 20 to 25% down, it's 75% to 80% LTV. Um, you know, you've got your monthly uh, carrying costs and all that. And, but with a credit union, this particular one that I've done several flip deals with is no money out of pocket. I provide them with my own uh, comparables uh, based on the house that I'm going to rehab and flip. I just show similar ones within the past six months to a year, send it to the VP of commercial lending. He, he approves it and shows it to a commit, small committee that's local in that same building of the bank of that credit unit, excuse me. And then, you know, I've never not been approved and it's been, and I've, you know, some of the initial education you, you have to do as well as, just on the flip side of how to do a market uh, analysis. And uh, it's been great. You do, you know, have the monthly holding cost, but definitely, definitely have strength and uh, a relationship there to get things done quicker. Um, you know, maybe let's say my credit score is a little bit lower just because of the relationship I have with them. I'm able to continue, continue that um, doing so. So that's a little bit of the difference as far as a program that they have, that this particular one has locally with no money out of pocket, uh, which is huge. When you're trying to do two or three projects at one time. Yeah. And we've seen, you know, we, in our episode with uh, Jesse Shelton and his mm -hmm. flipping business, you know, he was able to establish a, a really good relationship with, uh, I think it was one or two local lenders and he ended up with extremely favorable terms after proving himself to them and was able to grow his, his business. And is now, you know, since more or less retired from it. Right. Um, right. So that relationship building within your community can really pay off. It takes a little while, um, but it's probably worth it. Um, you, there may be a, a little bit of a disadvantage specifically with uh, credit unions as uh, going back to the multifamily side, they, uh, they typically don't offer any kind of interest only, um, whereas community banks may. Um, that, but credit unions are also typically cheaper on the acquisition side. So, you know, and, and the same with the community bank, you know, that particular loan officer is only going to do what that bank will allow him to do. Right. So, um, and one of does, the disadvantage, sorry, one of the disadvantages the credit unions are that they lend very locally. The credit union that I've used around my hometown, when I tried to finance an asset two hours away, they would do it. So oh, really? whereas the community bank is more willing to go, you know, basically a day's drive, if you will, a lot of them. Um, but yeah, they, they could not or would not do it. So that's another disadvantage. So, and that's where, again, uh, maybe using a commercial loan broker uh, in your arsenal as well is is handy because they may be they may have relationships with multiple community banks 
and multiple credit unions. So instead of you having to go and seek out relationships directly, this is, I would say, even uh, very helpful when you're first getting started. You can leverage a commercial broker who has these relationships already in place to help steer you towards where he thinks you may be able to place your particular project. Um, so you're just giving Absolutely. your your information, your financials, the project information to one person and they're broadcasting it to their network. So until you're able to get your own network built up, uh, a commercial loan broker can be very helpful with that. And again, that's that's a, where do you find those? You find those in the same places you find the private hard money people, you know, LinkedIn, meetups, uh, bigger pockets, referrals. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of great stuff. point. So, um, yeah, I mean, community banks, credit unions, for a while, they were kind of not getting a ton of attention after the whole COVID thing hit, and uh, the agency debt really started to put the the brakes on some of what they do, or just made um, their pre-closing requirements so restrictive with reserves and things like that. Uh, community banks have gotten a lot more uh, competitive. Uh, so I would definitely check them out. Yeah, we've seen that. Uh, we've seen that it's one of those things. It's almost like, oh, we missed an opportunity. Now we need to take advantage. Years ago, we missed an opportunity to be competitive with AC debt. Now we need to take advantage of it while they are really pulling back and requiring more reserves and whatnot up front. So mm -hmm. we've seen, we see that in, you know, um, news and in and, and our world, uh, financing uh, people that talk about these things. And so that's, that's definitely, that definitely has occurred. And I think it's going to continue. They will continue to be aggressive going forward, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, should we go on to agency debt? Sure. So agency debt is kind of like the holy grail of multifamily and a lot of commercial debt, including mobile home parks, uh, industrial. That's that's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Um, in terms of all lending, it's actually a very small percentage of of loans that are that are held under agency debt because they only loan to a very small subset of, of the projects because like Darren alluded to earlier, they're looking to loan on uh, stabilized properties. So things that are in the multifamily space, 90% occupied uh, for 90 days or more is is the minimum. They actually look, you know, a lot farther back, but they they ultimately will will give you credit for ninety for ninety is what it's called. If if the lines if the numbers are trending in the right direction, so if you've got anything with a little bit of meat on the bone, um, you know, that's hovering around eighty five, eighty eight percent. You you've already been excluded from from agency debt, and then you know. Related to that, they also have some of the lowest debt service coverage ratio. So like 1.2, 1.25 or something like that. Um, well, that's not completely related, but uh, y you know, you, you may not be teed up to, to go directly after agency debt out of the gate anyway, for, for a number of reasons. Um, the 90 for 90. Also, you, you typically, you know, they're kind of a checklist orientated lender. You have to hit all of these parameters, one of which is experience with agency debt. So it's that, you know, chicken and egg type thing is how do you get experience with agency debt? If you don't have experience with agency debt, you're going to have to have somebody in your network to partner with in order to get that check box cleared off or, or marked. So um, that's something on the sideline that you'd be have to be doing as well is to, to build those relationships so that, you know, it's even available to you to get the agency debt. All right. In our particular example, the last loan we did and the first loan for agency debt was we brought on someone that has experience 
they signed on the loan and now therefore anyone else on that loan such as ourselves if you are on the loan and, and Greg you're on this particular loan is that now you can go to the next asset and say to Fannie or Freddie yeah here look here's my name on this one that doesn't necessarily mean you might be a sponsor or KP but uh, and that's a different topic sorry this uh, has to do with liquidity and liquidity and net worth but your experience will help carry that next loan across the finish line Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, and these these loans have the best terms. So they have the lowest interest rate. They have the longest loan term. You know, it can be out to 10 or 12 years even. Uh, you know, the amortization is typically out for 30 years. Uh, often there's a interest-only component available on them, and they're also non-recourse. So, um, um they're going after kind of the property first. You're not totally off the hook. There's carve outs for bad actors and things like that. But uh, um, with for all those benefits, the, there's there's bound to be something offsetting that that uh, and those offsets are uh, typically uh, high prepayment penalties, either as on a step down basis. So in the first year, you might have to pay. 5% back as a prepayment penalty, then four, three, two, one, that is semi-negotiable, um, or you have yield maintenance. So what that is, is they're basically, as the lender are guaranteeing them themselves, uh, uh, the, the yield that they signed on for the debt. So if you're paying in year three, but it was a 10 year note, there's gonna be yield maintenance to make up for most of the money they would have made if uh, they had held it over 10 years. So it's it's really a product that is designed for uh, long-term hold. So uh, if you're looking to get in and out of something in two or three years, probably not the best uh, product for you. Right, and um, you know, we're long-term uh, buy and hold uh, investors and so we only have one agency loan, but that but that is our you know plan to like I said, and that that's the best case scenario to, to move forward and go down the road as, as holding the asset. I will say, based on our experience, and I think most people will agree with this, uh, due to the experience required um, and just not knowing how extensive the agency um, loan process is, it's seems like it's more difficult, it's more grueling, if you will, to originate a loan out of the gate with agency debt than it is with community bank debt, which is why some, not all, multifamily specifically investors originate with community bank and then go to agency. Um, but, you know, we can say we've done it, originated more. It was tough, but um, I think I would prefer moving forward community bank, but you know, it's done. And generally when you get such great terms out of the gate, your opportunity for refinancing is, is very slim down the road. Uh, that's just another thing to consider. And, and that's another uh, topic we can discuss at length later, but uh, there's disadvantages and advantages to each. And it just depends on the situation and the asset and the investor pool of how you want to go about doing things. Uh, but you know, the agency is a lot of work. Yeah, and the loan amount. You know, like, uh, you know, if, you, if your project doesn't even have a loan amount, and don't quote me on this, but it's somewhere around, I think, $750,000 is the yeah, lowest loan so. amount that I think Freddie small balance will go down to, you know, you're, you're not even going to be considered. So some, sometimes the, uh, you know, the project size is going to dictate who you're going to be able to bring it to. So ultimately, you know, having all of these in your potential pool to pull from, depending upon what you're into, um, can be extremely helpful. I would, you know, we're certainly trying to get the community bank 
relationships built up more than than we were a year ago just because the climate changed so we got right. a little behind mm -hmm. on that and now we're like oh man we really need to focus on this a little bit more um but that's really yeah i think you know some of those terms are thrown around and i, I don't know if everybody really knows uh exactly what they mean or how much crossover there is or, or when they might be appropriate or not appropriate or, or even if it's on the table at all so that's what we did today was yeah. just trying to just uh shed some more understanding for everyone out there based on your experience level and if some of those terms don't make sense just you know feel free to reach out to us shoot us an email or text if you have our number or email whatever uh you know we continue to learn ourselves and so this is we, this has been mostly based on our experience and, and experience of others that we know. So uh, we just want to shoot something out there today to hopefully help someone that may not know the difference or is, has wondered what some of these are. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Well, we'll wrap it up then. Uh, I'll take us out, Darren. We want to thank you for joining us Thanks, here. Man. Real Wealth Solutions Podcast. Uh, we got a ton of guests on the calendar coming up. So uh we're looking forward to that and we'll see you on the next episode later. See you, everybody. Bye.